You know, as Christians, we understand that the Bible is the guide that we use to direct our conduct, and that has been the same, you know, the same ideas ever since God's word became available to, the, uh, to, man, to mankind. The ability to read it and understand and discern what, you know, what is God's will for us. However, this doesn't mean that we always you know, it doesn't mean that we're always able to do it. You know, the, the, the problem with the human beings is even if we understand what God's will is, sometimes we don't always have the ability to carry out what it says. But we do use it to determine if what we've done is right or wrong. It is a guide in that sense. So a lot of times it's easy, the point I'm getting at, sometimes it's easy to figure out which way we should go, what's the right thing, what's the wrong thing, you know? Murder, right or wrong? Well, you know, that's not a hard one, you know? thou shalt not kill. You know, murder is an easy one. Uh, how about adultery? A little bit of adultery is, you know, adultery in moderation? No, I don't think so. So you, know, you get the idea that um, uh, adultery is, is wrong. It's an easy one to figure out. Lying, stealing, uh, we know that those things are wrong and, and we don't have to have a big debate. I've never seen a debate you know, in our brotherhood, for example, big debate tonight, we're going to debate whether lying is right or wrong. You know, we we kind of know those things. The Bible is pretty clear about those things. Uh, not only the things that we ought not to do, but the things we ought to do. You know, to love others, is that right or wrong? Well, you know, there's so, many, so much teaching, especially in the New Testament, about loving one another, loving our enemies. So it, that's a no-brainer, loving other people. How about worshiping God, you know, is that a good thing? Yes, it is a good thing. So when giving reasons why someone ought to do something or not to do something, we can usually point to the Bible and say that uh, this is what the Bible says or this is how the Bible directs us. And many times it's, it is black and white. You know, murder, adultery, steal, you know, it is black and white. We don't have to have a long debate to figure out if what we're doing is right and wrong. Now, as I said, we may not agree or we may not be able to do what it says, but at least it's clear. We don't have to worry about, you know, are we understanding what the Bible says about a particular subject. But problems begin to arise when we go into the Bible and it requires us to use judgment or discretion in order to get our answer. Judgment or discretion. This is what I mean when I talk about judgment. Judgment, for example. Judgment is where we make a decision based on the general principles found in the Bible because there are no specifics to guide us. There are no thou shalt do this or thou shalt do that. There are a lot of subjects where we don't have a specific instruction. And one example that I use for this is birth control. And you might think birth control, you know, why use that? Well, when I was uh, uh, teaching or preaching in, in Canada, in Montreal especially, birth control was a big issue because many people who had become uh, members of the church had once been Catholic. And for them, the birth control issue was, was like a big issue. Is it right or is it wrong? And, and so uh, you, there's, no, there's no chapter and verse that says thou shalt not use birth control or thou shalt use, you know, there's no chapter and verse. You have to make a judgment call based on general principles in the Bible. For example, um, uh, thou shalt not murder. Exodus chapter 20 uh, tells us, for example, that we have, to, uh, we have to respect existing life. So there's a broad principle you know, where uh, we find the idea of abortion. Well, there's some, some people use abortion as their method of birth control. And so we can see from a general principle in the Bible that we have to respect life. So that gives us some guidance in our decision making on birth control. Uh, it also says, uh, thou shalt love you know, your neighbor as who? As yourself. You have to love yourself. And so that gives you some, some guidelines as far as maintaining the health of the mother for example. Um, and also it, uh, the Bible gives us some direction as to the, uh, uh, the ability of the parents to raise perhaps more children. Uh, in 1 Timothy 5.8, Paul talks about uh, the high priority of 
being able to care for your own family. And so you have to take general principles in order to come to a conclusion about a subject that may not be clearly defined in the Bible. So the Bible provides broad principles to help us make a judgment call. So that's one thing when you have to make a judgment call. Another thing is discretion. Discretion is where we make a decision based not only on the broad principles found in the Bible, because there are no specifics, but also we factor in the effect that our decision will have on other people, especially Christians. And so the decisions based on discretion are usually the most difficult to make because they're different for each person and they require a great amount of self-sacrifice. They usually involve things that are not in themselves bad, but may be interpreted as being evil or perhaps unchristian or unorthodox by others. That's why you have to use discretion. The dilemma is usually expressed like this. Why should I deny myself, and you fill in the blank, whatever, why should I deny myself blank just because it might offend somebody else? So you might be wondering, why am I talking about all this? Because Paul received this kind of question from the Corinthians. Why should I deny myself blank just because it might offend somebody else? So he gets this kind of question from the Corinthians and in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 he tells them how to deal with issues that required the use of discretion. Because as much as we'd like for the Bible to be black and white about everything, not everything is answered with a black and white response. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Verses 1 to 13, he talks about this, this problem. Now, just a little background again about uh, the situation there. In those days, in Greece, there were many pagan temples to various gods, and each one of these temples had you know, its own ceremonies, including animal sacrifices. Now, the interesting thing about pagan sacrifices was this. Unlike the Jewish sacrificial system where the animal was destroyed and its remains were used by the priests and the Levites and even the person offering the sacrifice. In other words, it was, the, the lamb was killed, but it was also eaten. Okay? It was used by the priests and the Levites and the ones offering sacrifices. Pagan sacrifice was not like this. Pagan animal sacrifices often found the meat from the animals sold in public markets after the pagan rituals were over. For the pagans using animal sacrifices, the sacrificed animal was not eaten, was not required to be eaten like it was in Jewish sacrificial systems. Okay? So that was, that was, that's an important difference that we have to understand here. They would sacrifice the animal and then the animals were just sent off to market. So the problem then was that there were some Christians who were buying meat at the market where some of this type of meat had originally been used in pagan sacrifice. Now the problem arose in the church there in Corinth when some Christians disapproved of this and they were offended because they felt that their Christian brethren were in some indirect way involving themselves in pagan worship. In other words, they were assuming if you went to the market and you bought some meat, I mean, who knows if that cut of lamb, <laughs> you know, if that piece of meat there versus that piece of meat there, there was no way of knowing which had been sacrificed to, to, to pagan, you know, in pagan worship. It's just that some of the meat mixed in with the others may have been sacrificed to animals. And so some disapproved. They said, boy, if you're, if you're doing this, you're enabling, if you wish, pagan sacrifice in some indirect way. So if you buy this kind of meat, they said, you know, you're part of the system. You're supporting that system. And therefore they were offended. And there became you know, a kind of a, 
a division that rose up among the church. And you might say, well, that's, uh, you know, thankfully we don't have that problem today, right? Well, I can tell you there are some Christians who will not shop at certain stores, for example, because that company pays benefits to the partners of gay employees. I'll give you an example. Um, the company that was probably the first to supply benefits to the partners of gay employees was the Disney company. The Disney company ratio wise has probably more gay employees than any other corporation in America. And yet, does that mean we're not going to watch The Lion King? See what I'm saying? You're going to the movies? You're, you're letting your children watch The Lion King? Well, boy, that's produced by a company that has practices that I don't agree with and you're, you're indirectly supporting a company that you're supporting gay rights. So, you know, I mean, I could repeat this example over and over again. You know? Someone that supports some company that sells hardware, whatever, to the military, and they're, and they're pacifists, and they're saying, well, I, I don't agree in war, I believe ki all killing is wrong, we should never be involved in war, and you're buying, you know, a, you're buying a, a blender from a company that also has contracts with the military? You're indirectly supporting war, and I'm against war. You see, it's very easy to go down that road, even today. So, in teaching them, Paul deals with two issues here. The first is the specific issue. Okay, the specific issue. And the specific issue is the following. Is eating this meat a sin? That's the specific issue. This was the debate that the brethren were having and Paul addresses this in different places in the chapter, in verses four to six, and in verse seven to eight. Concerning this question of sin, he says three things. So let's go to chapter eight, begin, beginning in verse four. He says, therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom are all things. And we exist for Him and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through Him. So the first thing he says about it is that only those who practiced idolatry are guilty of idolatry. The ones that go to the pagan temple and worship at the pagan temple and participate in the pagan sacrifice, he says, they are the ones that are guilty of idolatry. And there's a reason for that, because Christians recognize only God and only His Son, Jesus Christ, as the Son of God. So for Christians, idols are nothing more than wood and stone, and meat used in whatever way is only meat as far as the Christian is concerned. When that Christian goes to the store and he buys a pound of hamburger or whatever, for him, that's just hamburger, because he doesn't believe in idols. Christians eat with the understanding that all food comes from God, regardless of what men may do or think about the meat in between time. That's not on them. Okay? Second thing he says, this time in, um, in verse seven, he says, however, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So the second thing he says is, not everybody is used to this idea, especially Greek Christians who have been raised to see idolatry and its practices as an important part of life. So not everybody thinks, listen, there's only one God, there's only you know, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Not everybody thinks that way. Not everybody's been raised that way. 
For a former idolater, meat sacrifices to an idol has been tainted and his conscience cannot help but see it as an offense against the true God. So basically he's saying, not every, you know, here's the truth. There's no such thing as an idol. And the sin is on the idolater. But then he says, but not everybody thinks that way because of the way they were raised, because of their experiences. Of course, one problem here could have been the different backgrounds between the Jews and the Greeks who were in the same congregation. The Jews who grew up and then were converted to Christianity, they had no problems with idolatry. That was not part of their heritage. I mean, their ancient heritage, maybe, that they had fallen into idolatry, but by New Testament time, the Jews were not guilty of idolatry. So they knew who the true God were. They knew they worshiped the true God. The revelation of Jesus was simply added on to that. But for a Greek, for a Gentile, this was new stuff. He, had, he or she had, been, had grown up worshiping many gods, offering meat sacrifices to idols you know, throughout their lives. And so Paul then says a third thing about this issue in verse, in verse eight. He says, but food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better or if we do eat. So Paul repeats a principle that Jesus taught in Mark chapter seven, verse 19. Basically that food does not have the power to make you pleasing or not pleasing to God. God loves vegans. God loves vegetarians. God loves meat eaters. What you eat does not make you better or worse before God. Now, from a health perspective, perhaps, you know, not to eat too much meat or whatever, you know, but as far as holiness is concerned, you cannot become more holy by giving up eating meat. And you are not unholy because you happen to enjoy a T-bone. It has no power to do that type of thing. You know, the Pharisees taught that if a Gentile touched a certain food that a Jew who later purchased and ate, in other words, if a Gentile handled the food at the market and the Jew came and bought that food, whether it was meat or vegetables or whatever, then the Jew would become impure. And he or she would need to purify themselves before going on to worship. Such was the stricture of the Pharisaic laws. Jesus taught that food all by itself did not have the ability to purify you or to make you impure. It's just food. And depending on your size and your health, you, you, you're free to regulate how much, you know, maybe you, you need to eat less food. Some people need to eat more food. You know, it, but it doesn't have the power to make you holy in any way. And so Paul repeats this idea here, stating that you couldn't catch immorality. You can't catch it, it's not a virus. And you cannot catch idolatry, like a disease, from food. Food is neutral. In other words, it's just meat. So in response to the specific issues of sinfulness, Paul says basically, the sin belongs to the idolaters and cannot be transferred to the Christians through the meat. And idolaters sin because they serve idols. Christians are righteous because they serve Christ, irregardless of what they, of what they eat. So Paul now moved, that was the specific, right? We said he's going to answer the specific question. Is it a sin if we eat meat sacrificed to idols? And he answers that, he answers that question with a specific answer. No, it is not. And then he gives some reasons why. Okay, now, now he moves on to the broad principle. And the broad principle is this. What do you do when something isn't a sin, but your conscience feels like it's a sin? See, that's a trickier, a trickier idea. Sometimes we feel guilty, and rightly so, because according to the Bible, we're doing something wrong. If you embezzle your company and you feel guilty, well, you should. If you cheat on your taxes, 
you know, and you, you, you fail to report income, and you, know, you just cheat, so you don't have to pay too many taxes, and then after you're kind of feeling guilty, well, you should. That's what your conscience is there for, to make you feel guilty when you do something wrong. But sometimes we feel guilty and the Bible doesn't condemn necessarily our activities, just our conscience. That happens a lot. So this was the problem here. Paul has told them that there's no sin in eating this meat, but there are still some in the church who feel guilty about it. What do we do about that? Again, his teaching is kind of spread out throughout this chapter, but he does give three answers, three specific ideas to this particular problem. First of all, we have to go back to chapter eight in verse one, two, and three. So let's, let's read one, two, and three. First thing he says is that love is higher than knowledge. So verse one, two, and three says, now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by Him. So I repeat, Paul says, first of all, love is, is a higher virtue than knowledge. You know, he has given them knowledge about the legality of what they are doing. Technically, they are not wrong if they eat. That's knowledge from God. But the guiding principle for our knowledge, he says, is love. Love is, is what directs knowledge. And God knows the ones who love Him because it is evident in their actions. God knows the ones that love Him because they're acting out of love. They're using their knowledge, but they're acting out of love. So those who love God use love in their application of knowledge. And his point is that we have knowledge is not what pleases God. It's how we use knowledge that pleases God. There are a lot of smarty alecks in the world, but not all of them are pleasing to God. So Christians, through grace, use love to guide their knowledge. Second thing he says, this time in verses nine to 12, he says, Christians through grace have received a license to love. In other words, we've received from God permission to love other people. Let's read verses nine to 12 this time. He says, but take care lest this liberty of yours, this liberty means you've received knowledge, you've been freed from the stricture of Thou shalt not eat this meat. You're free now, you have this knowledge. Listen to what he says. But take care lest this liberty of yours somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, uh, will not his conscience if, he is, uh, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And thus by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Tricky situation. You know, he says, you have knowledge and this knowledge has given you liberty, freedom in this case to eat, but be careful that you don't use your freedom selfishly. You know, God gives us liberty and freedom and license, but our license is not to indulge ourselves, our license is to be used for loving other people. So in this instant, Paul describes a hypothetical situation. He says, what if you use this freedom to indulge in this food and a brother with a weak conscience copies you? You know the idea is, well, if he can do it, I can do it. But in doing so, he realizes that his conscience will just not permit it. And he feels worse. Paul doesn't say it, but the danger is that he may fall away or continue to do a lawful thing, but because he has a guilty conscience, for him, a lawful thing has become a sin, right? Even if you do something that is permitted, but you go against your own conscience, for you, that's a sin. 
In addition to this, Paul says that in disregarding his weak condition and providing him with the excuse to violate his own conscience and thus sin, you also are guilty of sin. You pushed him into doing this, he's saying. So those who love God are free to live in Christ as they choose, but this freedom doesn't allow them to be free from the responsibility of caring for other people and caring for their souls. All right, he goes on. Another question, verse 13. How far do we go? So let's read verse 13. He says, therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, that I might not cause my brother to stumble. And so here he's answering the unasked question, how far do we go with this? The fear here is that people will take advantage if we give up what we are allowed to do every time somebody objects under the heading of offense. Now you can't do that because that offends me. In other words, what good is freedom if we are prisoners of other people's weaknesses? <laughs> what good is it? What good is it that I'm free to eat and drink and do whatever I like you know, in Christ, things permitted? What good is that freedom if every time you know, I'm doing something, someone says, no, no, you can't do that because I will not permit myself to do it. So if I won't permit me to do it, then I won't permit you to do it. And so some of the brethren are saying, well, what good's this freedom? Now in Romans chapter 14, and I want you to kind of stay in 1 Corinthians there, but just flip over to Romans while you're, while you're at it. Chapter 14, verses three and four, Paul gives further instruction to help avoid this kind of situation. 14, three and four. He says, let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So it seems that this was a problem in the Roman church as well. So Paul is kind of speaking to two groups here. He says, those who are strong. The strong are those who exercise their Christian liberty in good conscience, doing things that are not wrong. I mean, Christian freedom doesn't mean you're free to sin. It means you're free. You know, nobody can tell you don't touch, don't eat, don't drink, don't do this. You know, no, nobody's your boss. The Bible is your guide. And if the Bible permits you something, then you're permitted that thing. Okay? So those who are strong, those people, they shouldn't be impatient and unloving or unkind to those who are weak in conscience and are unable to permit themselves the same things. Now there's, you know what he's saying, no name calling, no accusations of legalism or narrow mindedness or immaturity. You know, he's talking to the strong, he says, you, you people are strong, you know, don't look down on the people who are weak, don't call them names, don't, you know. And then those who he refers to as weak, those that can't permit themselves things that are permissible because of their background, their weak conscience, whatever. He says, those people, you should not act like judges over the actions of other Christians. You know, he, say, he says to them, who made you the judge? You don't get to judge your brother. God will judge your brother. And your brother will stand or fall. He'll be judged innocent or guilty by God, not by you. You have no right to judge your brother in things that are not sinful. Obviously, if your brother sins, you know, the Bible says, go to him. Reprove him, encourage him. So he says, you're not allowed to judge the actions of other Christians, and here's the key, especially when their criticism cannot be soundly supported by God's word. You know, you have some old boy over here, he's married, he's got three kids, but he's got a girlfriend in another town and you find out about it, well, you know, that's called adultery. 
You better go see your brother then and you better talk to him and say, brother, you know what you're doing and I know what you're doing and I can show you a chapter and verse, you know, Exodus 20, thou shalt not commit adultery. This is wrong, you, you have to stop, you know. But unless you can support it with the scriptures, you have to be very careful, Paul says. Now, here's the thing. A lot of times, it's not a question of truly being offended or stumbling. You know, Paul says that to make someone stumble or to offend them means to influence them to do something that their own conscience will not permit. That's the biblical um, explanation of offense or stumbling. So sometimes the strong use Christian freedom as an excuse to act or indulge in worldly activity, like gambling, for example, or vices, without feeling guilty. They say, well, I'm under grace, I can do this, God will permit me a little, you know, I can cross the line because I'm under grace. Sometimes the strong, you know, they use their freedom just a little too, they're a little too free. They think freedom means I have the freedom to indulge in vices without consequences. And the sin there, believe it or not, the sin there is not indulging in the vice. The sin there is pride to think that you're so special that God will permit you to sin without consequence. And then on the other hand, the weak, they often say that they are offended when in reality they're just uncomfortable or they're jealous because someone is doing something that they will not permit themselves to do, but they twist the scriptures or they use tradition as their basis of argument. I mean, I've been working in the church for a long time as a minister and I, I've heard people say to me, well, that, that offends me. I don't know, uh, young people have a lock-in, let's just say. You know, young people have a lock-in on a Friday night. You know, lots of supervision, boys over here, girls over there. You know what I mean? It's all done properly and you know, we're just trying to get them to be together and so on and so forth. You know, and someone says, well, I, you know, I'm not comfortable with that idea. Someone will come up and say, I'm not comfortable with that idea. Really, yeah, that offends me. No, 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 no. That, I'm sorry, you, know, you may be uncomfortable with it and so on and so forth, but, how, but biblically this is not provoking you to do something that, uh, that is a sin for you. You're just uncomfortable with it because you're not used to it. Or maybe that's not the way you think things ought to run. But a true sin, you know, when we criticize another for their actions and we claim that we've been offended, it better be because a, a true sin, according to the Bible, has been committed. And B, we have been uh, provoked to violate our own conscience by the influence of another's action. That's what offense means, according to the Bible. If not, then we're merely judging our brothers and sisters according to our own standards, not God's standards. So when we say I'm offended, we're usually saying, well, according to my standard, this is not okay. And when it comes to that in the church, you know, we have to be willing to, what is it that we say? Agree to? To disagree. Both the weak and the strong should leave the judging to God because it is God who will save both the strong and the weak according to His grace, not according to one's relative strength or weakness. Because the strong are not any more saved than the weak. Both of them are saved in exactly the same way. They both need the grace of God. So in the end, we have to go as far as we need to in order to guarantee that our actions do not contribute to the destruction of another soul. That may not always be fair, but it'll always be right. And in the end, we want to do what's right and not just what's permitted, not just what's fair. So, not everything in Christianity is black and white. Sometimes we have to make decisions. And sometimes we have to make decisions using, one, judgment, assessing what we know about the word of God and making the best decision we can given the circumstances. You know, do I move to, do we, do we sell the house and move over here for the new job or not? Well, there's nothing in the, we want to do God's will. So we have to use a judgment call. And B, 
Sometimes we have to use discretion. Not only using what we know about the Bible, but measuring the impact of our decision on the faith of someone else. For example, do I take job A or job B? You know, do we sell the house and move to X place so I can get a, a better job you know, and it'll pay $20,000 more? Well, sounds good, but then you start you, know, you look at the town that you're going to, for example, oh, there's no church there. Well, that doesn't happen much in the United States, certainly in the southern, you know, pretty much any town you go to here has got a, a, a congregation of the church. But up in Canada, for example, you know, somebody will move to a town that'll have 50,000 people or something, you know, there isn't a church for 100 miles, 200, 300 miles. So now, you know, hmm. I've got three young kids, I've got a wife and a family, I don't know anybody, there are no members of the church there, there isn't even a church there. Now what I'm weighing is, hmm, $20,000 more in salary, no church life. I stopped going to church. Can we survive just the family having worship by ourselves you know, every Sunday? Hmm. I could do it one Sunday or two, but could I do it one year, year in and year out? Do I have the ability to start a church? If there isn't, you know, that's discretion. That's how you use it. Paul teaches that we must not only consider what is lawful in order to please God, we must decide what is loving as well. Is that really loving my children and my wife to isolate them from other Christians? You see? So we need to remember that when God chose to save us, he didn't do it based on the law, because according to the law, we should have been condemned and left to suffer in hell if it was according to the law. If salvation was based on the law, then all of us would have to be perfect in order to be saved, right? No sin. You can be saved according to the law, you just, you mustn't break it, not even one time. I mean, that's how Jesus did it. Jesus was risen from the dead, not because of the grace of God, He was risen from the dead, why? No sin. He was perfect according to the law. And so because He was perfect according to the law, sin, death could not hold Him. But that's not the case with us. None of us can be or will ever be perfect according to the law and, have, and be saved in that way. And when God chose to save us, He didn't do it on fairness either. Not based on fair, we always, we use that. That's not fair. We say to God, that's not fair. You know, I, I worked hard, I did my best at my job, you know, blah, blah, blah. I helped this other person that came in and I tutored them and I mentored them and I really gave to them and, and then they got promoted ahead of me and now they're firing me. You know, we're having a company, what do they call it, a downsizing. And the guy that I mentored and helped to, to go up in the company, he's the one that's downsizing me out of a job. God, that's not fair. Isn't that what we say to him all? It's not fair. And God says, well, you know what? It wasn't fair that Jesus, who did no sin, who always obeyed, should suffer punishment for my sin. That's not fair either. But God didn't save us based on fairness. He based his decision on love. What was necessary in order to guarantee the salvation of our souls? Love. And that's the basis upon which our decisions should be made. We need to ask God to forgive us and to help us to mature spiritually. If we violated our own conscience, it's okay to say to God, please forgive me, I violated my own conscience. It's okay to say to God, please forgive me for that. And a good additional prayers, please expand my conscience. Please, Lord, help me to enjoy the things that are lawful for me without guilt. And usually that involves him working on another part of your personality. And we need to mature spiritually if we've encouraged by our actions someone else to violate their conscience. Or if we've accused others of sin for actions that are not really sin, but just things we just don't like. That bugs me, I don't like that. Or we've been impatient with brethren who don't enjoy the same level of freedom in Christ that we do. It's easy to, the word is despise. It's easy to despise our brothers because either they have more freedom than us 
or they refuse to use the freedom that they have. But our relationship with one another is always based in love, not in law, not in fairness, it's based in love. And with love, love permits all good things. Okay, that's uh, Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter eight. We move on and upwards. 